It's time to do some hardcore grokkin'. That's right, we're gonna deep dive on some RPG game design tonight. So clutch your dice bags, because it's time for the Mythwits. The show dedicated to all things geek pop culture, drenched in absurdity and coated with sarcasm, every week we bring on an industry guest to talk about the ever-expanding Geekoverse and to play a game with us. We do our damnedest to be funny, but there are no guarantees. I am your host, Peter Bryant. And joining me this week is my mole-like appendage, Mike Kafis. Hey, uh, I left my dice bag at the other apartment, buddy. <laughs> All right, well, you, you didn't have know to... We were wrong with this. Can I borrow a die? <laughs> <laughs> right. And our guest... Can I borrow a dice? Guest, this guest this week is Sean Merwin. I have got plenty of dice for you, sir. Plenty oh, of dice. Fantastic. All right, so... Um, I didn't write up a big bio. I don't have a big bio on Sean. This was sort of last minute. Normally, I invite my guests, you know, weeks weeks out. Uh, but we had a hole in our schedule because I've been so busy. Um, but I was on another podcasting thing called AetherCon. Uh, and, and, and I had some moderators. Uh, we all do it together. So Mike was a moderator for one. Sean's a moderator for several. And... Uh, Sean, I I had I failed in my duties to send Sean the instructions on how to run uh, the setup the way we do it, and uh, so I was like, all right, we'll do it together. So I launched it, I invited Sean in, uh, and then our guest didn't show up for a while. He was late, and, and you know these things happen. Times it was a time zone confusion. So Sean and I, you know, show must go on. Sean and I started talking about game design. Uh, and I we really had a great discussion. I was I was loving it. I was like, oh. The, this guy loves to talk game design. I was like, kindred, kindred spirit. So uh, I was like, we got to have him on the show. So I had a hole and I contacted him. He was happy to come on. So Sean, thank you. Thank you for joining us and filling our hole. <laughs> well, you, know, you put it that way. Can we do this for three or four hours? <laughs> right. Nice. Very nice. Um, so Sean, Sean has worked on a number of, of things, a number of products. He's an independent game designer, and um, you know he works on whatever comes along that, that, that I guess interests you or is in your, your bailiwick there. Um, so of all these things that, that he works on, I would like to start out with D&D 5th Edition because I have never actually played D&D 5th Edition. As, and I was telling Sean before the show, you know, in the pre-show, that I had tried many times to uh, to get in a, in a game. But I, when I go to conventions, I do so much work at these conventions and run my own events and, and, you know, and try and spend time with people and promote. And I just keep missing out. And this last one, I was like, I'm going to go. And I had a game scheduled. And I completely forgot about it until about an hour into it. And I was like, Damn it, missed it again. So I have some questions about D&D 5th edition. Right. Uh, and, Before and, you ask your question, can you yes. explain to me, because you know how I am in the D&D cheap seats. Uh, gotcha. What, and I barely know about, you know, like D20 as far as D&D. So what is the big difference? What is so, you know, like why should I even get involved with 5th edition? All right, well, well, Mike, that, that's a hard one because there's a lot of edition. But, Sean, uh, answer this the best way you can, I guess, because you're more of an expert than I am. Yeah, I think what 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 fifth edition did was take the best of all the D and D editions that we've seen. Um, first and second edition, there was a lot of flexibility with the rules because the rules weren't that great, uh, and people ignored the rules that didn't work. But there was so much lore, and there was so much history, and there was so much cool stuff that hadn't been done before that the first and second edition people loved it for that reason. Third edition came along, and it really made building a character robust. You could build any kind of character, which is great. The problem is you could build any kind of character you want and you could really break the rules. And there became so much uh, uh, of a glut of extra rules that you could use that it became unwieldy. Fourth edition came along and really streamlined the game. Uh, it made it one of the best tabletop skirmishing games I've ever seen. But as a role-playing game, it kind of lost that feel of, of the, the days of yore. So what 5th edition has come along and done is learned all the lessons from those previous four editions. Uh, it streamlined the game so anyone can pick it up and play it. Um, you, you got rid of the FACO tables, and you got rid of all of the that not-so-subtle um, baggage from 1st and 2nd edition and ca capped the, the spirit of it um, mm -hmm. and, and brought that. So... For that reason, 5th edition has been the highest-selling version of D&D 
in history. Uh, right. The fifth edition player's handbook has sold more than the third edition, the 3.5 edition, or the fourth edition in their lifetime. Good Lord, really? So, wow. Yep. And it's a lot because of podcasting and streaming. People are able to watch people play. They, uh, A, well, learn well, how cool the game can be, okay. and B, they don't need to read the rules out of the book because they can see people playing and they can learn mm -hmm. that way. So it's been a perfect storm uh, in a good way of the technology meeting a good addition of the rules for our players, and, and that's why it's exploded the way it has. You know, I, I got to give Wizards some credit. So when 4th Edition came out, I did try that version, and mm -hmm. I absolutely hated it. I mm -hmm. hated it. I was like, oh my god, this is everything an RPG shouldn't be. But you're right, it was a great skirmish game. If you were using, fi it was a great figure battle game is what it was. Yep. And you're right, it was fantastic for that. It was awesome. But, like, I was like, oh, I don't feel like I'm role-playing at all. And, you know, I, I don't want to... I don't want to throw wizards under the bus too much on this or like or give them too much crap about this. They tried an experiment. They were trying to modernize. They were trying to 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 do some new things. Uh, they took a chance and they they rolled the die and they mm -hmm. and in my opinion, it was a fumble as far as RPGs go. As far as a game, no, I mean as far as games go, it was a good game. I just right. didn't think it was a good RPG. But what what I'm really going to give them credit on is that even though they went all in on 4th edition and they made all these changes and stuff, they looked at it, they said, man, what are we doing wrong? And they listened to the fans and they, they, yep. they, they were very humble about it and came out with this new version and they did it as from everyone, who's, everyone I've talked to has ever played it. They've done it right. They did a service. So yep. uh, bro, uh, David in the chat room wants to know about uh, 3.5. So what what are our what are our thoughts on that? What, um, in in what way? Uh, does yeah, he, yeah, that's a sorry. big question, Mike. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I what, what third <laughs> edition did was make D and D a good game, because D and D was a fun hobby in first and second edition, but if you look at the game mechanics of it, it was Rough. it wasn't great, and. Most of the fun that you had, and especially in first edition days, um, I went back and when fifth edition was uh, was being developed, I went back to played all the old editions again, and I looked at my first edition player's handbook. And you know, I'm I'm a kid at the time. I'm like eight years old to twelve years old while I'm playing this. I could have never played that game. That game we were playing was not the book game that was in the book because That's I correct. learned from guys uh, that were older than me and they had their own way of playing so what third edition did was make it a game that could be played like a game from straight out of the book yeah dude uh, if we that, if that we ignored so much shit in the first edition we yeah. ignored um i don't know the web the way the weapon proficiencies weapon, speed. was, weapon speeds we ignored yeah. that we we actually ignored like racial levels you know, mm -hmm. like like the yep. the level maxes for races. We're like, that's crap. Uh, we um, right. God, there was so much stuff. And and Mike, to give you an you, idea what what Thacko is like, do you remember yeah. your favorite game, Time Lords? How damage goes to eleven, but it's not. Th uh, that's Thacko oh. in a nutshell. It it is like this thing oh. that everybody's like, huh? You know, <laughs> there's right. only there's only a group of there's only a small group of neckbeards who love love Thacko. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's all math, so it can be done in several different ways. Thacko was just like the worst way to do it, basically. Yeah, pretty much. Pretty. Oh, so, we lost Mike. Uh -oh. All right, he'll be back. He'll right. be back. Yep. <laughs> Thacko, Thacko killed Mike. Yes, he got Thackoed. <laughs> so, so yeah. So, so fifth edition. Um, now. All right. So when you make up a character, I'm going to go back to first edition. Like I said, I've only played first. First edition, I played a little bit of three, and I played fourth once. Um, not enough to really remember either one of the two a whole lot. I remember there was like classes and prestige classes in three and three point five. Um, but when I make up a character in um, when I make up a character in fifth edition, so I, I I roll my stats obviously, and I probably you know probably gonna have an idea of what I want to play. So I'm gonna you know move the stats around. Like I'll say, oh I rolled a 15. I'm gonna stick this one into decks because I want to play a ranger or something like that. Uh, then you pick your race, and then what? Is it still the same? Do you pick a class then at that yep. point? Okay. Yep. You can pick a class. Um, put your stats where you want the most. Uh, most 
classes will have a stat that's most important. So mm-hmm. for wizards, it's going to be intelligence. For fighters, it's going to be strength, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Only um, a big difference from say first edition days is charisma actually means something now. Um, right. It's a spellcasting stat now for uh, like uh, warlocks hmm. who who use magic from from within, not from studying from a book. So oh. all the stats now kind of have a class that's associated with them, except constitution, which is important for every class yes. because that deals your hit, you know, that manages your hit point levels. Uh, wait, 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 hold on, hold on. So, so charisma, charisma is a main stat now for someone. Yep. For, for the casters that are based on force of will rather than, than, um, you know, intelligence. I love it. Yep. Okay. So it's so it's not now just everyone's dump stat. Now right. you're going to have, you know, uh, warlocks walking around with charisma that's really high because that powers their spells. That uh, you know sets the saving throws for their spells that other creatures need to make, etc. And you know what I love about that? That is your warlock, like you see in a lot of movies, that is really like you know charming and but like like kind of sinister, you know, muscle twirl, mustache twirling, sinister yep. kind of charming in some ways. I mean, if they're the bad guy, if they're the good guy, you know. But that that's really cool. So do do a lot of um, is are people kind of do you ever see people leaning like playing like elves towards towards warlocks? I could see that being a nice combination: the charisma, the elf, the the magic. Yeah, I mean, it's you. You do see some people playing two type, so each race will get a bonus to his, to certain stats. Um, so elves, I think, get dexterity, mm-hmm. uh, but they're also proficient with swords, uh, you know, long swords and long bows right from the start. So they don't need to be a fighter to be proficient with those weapons. Um, but you'll also see people playing against type. So you'll see, you know, you'll see people playing half work. Uh, paladins or you know, wh- whatever because uh, you're it, you're less tied like in first edition you were really tied to a class with a with a uh, with a race like you said you ignored it but a lot of people you couldn't play a half work uh, magic user right right it just right, right. wasn't allowed now yeah, you, we, we ignored play. that yeah, exactly <laughs> That's so, cool. but now w- with the way you do ability scores and the way you create your character you can play against type all the time nice okay fantastic now um i I know so fourth edition did crazy shit with like maneuvers and you know you could do this three times a day and this at will blah 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 blah. Uh, and i know a lot of people have complained about playing magic users in that you you have actions for like you have like it's like, well, I have five spells I can cast, so I have five actions on this adventure for the most part. You know, like, did they fix any of Did they? Because I, I remember Pathfinder, I think it was Pathfinder, uh, we were doing on, on the, the game school. Uh, I was playing a cleric and I had some at will stuff, you know, like casting yep. light was like an at will. Did, did fifth edition do any of the kind of at will stuff? Yep, third edition uh, fixed that and then straight up fourth and fifth kept that going. So any okay. spellcaster now. They will have spells of, of levels where they're, that's a limited resource, but you'll also have cantrips. And those mm-hmm. cantrips can be cast at, as much as you want. So, so like a light could, spell. Well, well, even more than that, though. There were, are some offensive spells that are also cantrips. Right. So rather than, oh, I've shot my one magic missile for the day, now I have to sit back with a crossbow. Now you can have a variety of spells that also do damage. I mean, there's light, there's, there's some utility uh, cantrips, but there's also damaging cantrips. Okay. So, you know, you can you can kind of play that resource management game if you want. Well, I'm not going to use my big spells yet. I'm going to just use my cantrips over and over until I get to a situation where I want something bigger. And the good thing is the cantrips also scale as you level. So say say you have a cantrip like uh, I'm trying to think of like ice knife or something. Um, it's a D8 damage, but when you hit uh, fifth level or seventh level, uh, it goes up to two D8. And then oh, when you nice. get to the 11th level, it goes up to 3d8. So it, the, even that scales with the power of the, of the character. So it's not useless when you get up to higher levels. You, your cantrips can uh, still be very useful. Very cool. And Because if you think about it, like a magic user, if they can cast that level of spell on a regular basis, that's no different than your fighter using a sword every round. You know, It, it exactly. really doesn't unbalance anything. Right, and and then fighters will have their main attacks, but then they will also have ways that they can do extra special things uh, 
in any given round of combat. So they could just take their regular attacks, but at higher levels they're getting multiple attacks and then they might have some maneuvers they can do. Depending on the type of fighter they are, um, they might get a critical hit on a higher die, uh, on a lower die roll, so a 19 or 20 instead of just a 20. So there's different flavors of, even all the characters have different flavors. So you can play different flavor fighter, different flavor of magic users, and so on. Okay, okay. So Mike... Uh, Spence is in the chat room. I know. And she, yeah, she she mentioned uh, Spence is Spence is one of our good friends, and she she helps run game school. Um, she said Sacred Flame is her favorite cantrip. Yep. Um, so, so what, what what is that? What is Sacred Flame? It's a cleric cantrip that you cast at an enemy, um, and so it's even though it says flame, it's actually radiant damage, so it's kind of positive energy damage. And uh, the the target has to roll a saving throw, and if they fail, they take the damage. Okay. Oh wow. All right. So so you don't even have to hit. You just cast it. It's like kind of like magic missile. You say saving throw or take well, damage. The, the the other instead of rolling an attack roll, uh, instead of you rolling the attack roll, the enemy makes a saving throw. Nice. So and then the saving throw is set by how high your ability score is in that specific magic so for it's wisdom for clerics so if you have a super high wisdom there's probably a very low chance that the creature is going to be able to make that saving throw ah okay cool cool all right mike mike yes i'm chatting ask, in the room what do you, what do you want yeah, i was gonna say you should ask some D D questions you you I, of rather, all people i'd rather ask questions about like uh i don't know star trek Okay. Yeah. All right. Fine. Fine. All right. So, so D and D. So you can make up. You can make. I, I really like the way this is. This is going. Um, so hit points. Um, so is it still like you know first level, uh, whatever? Depending. Let's say D eight is my hit die. I, I roll one D eight, or do I start out with eight? Did they? Did they do that? Or you how start does that out work? with the highest. You start out with the highest of uh, for of your hit die. So barbarians okay. have the highest hit die at twelve. So they'll start out with 12 plus their constitution modifier of hit points. Right. Um, so in 4th edition, they really jacked it up quite a bit. So you, have, you might have like 20 or 30 hit points at first level. Um, whereas 1st edition, obviously, if you were a, you know, a wizard with a very low one, yeah, you might have one hit point to start. Right. You'd scratch the cat and die. Right. Uh, so it's less deadly than uh, like 1st and 2nd edition, but it's, it's a more deadly than 4th than, uh, than edition. Okay. All right, um, cool. You can still, you know, get one, you know, one uh, hit by an orc at first level and and bite it for sure. Okay. All right. Fantastic. So, in other words, you you suggest fifth edition, and I think I'm liking it. I think I, Mike, I gotta get total con. Don't let me. I have got to get in a fifth edition game. I gotta play I, a fifth I edition. I would try game. too. I mean, I'll give it a All shot. Right. You know. A, a right, lot so let, of conventions. A lot of conventions will run like a, a learn to play or an intro. Yeah. So maybe even an hour or two hours. One of the first things that I did for fifth edition was Wizards asked to have a uh, write an adventure that can be played in an hour. Mm -hmm. To have to still have a full story to still. So that was my first contract for fifth edition. Was okay. write this game that can be run in an hour that people will learn to play but get the full D and D experience. Sure. I was terrified. Oh yeah, <laughs> because you know some people were saying I can't even run a game in eight hours and get out of the tavern. How can you play a game? So, <laughs> but it, it actually worked really well. Um, and I've written probably five adventures now that have five parts, so you can run, um, you know, you can run one part or all five and get either the one hour experience to just get a taste of it, or if you play all five parts, that's a five hour experience and you kind of get a full adventure out of it. Very cool. Very. Cool. Hey, Pete. Uh, yeah. Dave says uh, when, when we're up at TotalCon, he'll run us uh, uh, an after hours five uh, e game. There you go. You got it, David. Put it on your calendar. We're gonna do it. Don't <laughs> do not fail me. Do not be nice fail to me. Dave. Right. Be nice so to Dave. that'll be fantastic. No, don't be nice. You can kill me. It's cool. I just. <laughs> oh yeah. I just want to play. I love play. dying at conventions. And and Dave, <laughs> make it make it like sixth or seventh level. That makes it interesting. It's not True. too powerful, not too low. I can actually we can actually do some stuff and fight some cool things. Um, but yeah, like like six seven. You think that's good, uh, uh, Sean? Yeah, absolutely. So after okay. about fourth, you're pr you're you're pretty good. Um, yeah. And what they did what they did that was nice was um, to level characters to go from first to second level. You basically only need a very few experience points. Um, so that it ramps you up to that fourth or fifth level plateau pretty quickly, where the 
sweet spot is, and then it slows down progression if you go by the the um, experience point rules. So you can then really dig into your character and, and uh, get the experience applying it. So you're like it's it's kind of like um it's kind of like you know movie like movie characters you know mm-hmm. they they go through the movie and by the time they're at the end of the movie they're like fourth or fifth level at that point which exactly. is where you would be if you went through like a movie's levels of 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 adventure exactly you know you get three or four encounters in there they're you know pretty hectic and and then and then boom you're 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 ready for the next uh next step all right so Very cool. big big daddy Spencer is in the room and he's a big trekkie so I am Uh-oh. going to insist. <laughs> Let's and go. We'll talk about Star Trek. Damn, I'm damn, I'm down with it because this new Star Trek sounds really cool. And Sean, you and I were talking. My favorite. Th- Let's talk about my favorite thing first. My favorite yeah. thing about being able to play NPC, like being able to play crew. So first off, you start. The character you make up is like a badass, right? I mean, like your main character that you play is yep. like one of the 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 main characters in the show. They are very capable, right? Yeah, exactly. They're they're fully functional. They are ready to go. They're ready to, to rock and roll. Uh, go, you know, go on the uh, away mission and not die. Right, but, but you can play. You can play red shirts, right? Absolutely. So w- we talked about this uh, at the other uh, podcast. But you know, what's the thing about Star Trek? Right. No matter what era, no matter what uh, show, there's always something going on on the ship while there's something even worse going down on the planet, right? And it's yes. that tension between the two. We can't beam them up for this reason. And there's something there and there's something here. So that doesn't make for a great role-playing game, though, if half of you is down on the planet, the other half up on the ship, and everyone's twiddling their thumbs while you go back and forth. So what this game says is you've got all these NPCs. Create your NPC. They will go down to the uh planet with half of your crew while you're up on the ship so you still have something to do while the uh, you know the three characters that that are playing their main pcs are down there but you're still there you're still participating uh, you still got a character sheet you still got everything and the cool thing is uh you know you can role play a different character than what you would normally play it's a it's kind of a freebie for you and you're giving these npcs a story and they can slowly build their way up if they're cool and if people like them to become a more major player in your game. Yeah. I, and I was saying there was like three things I love about this, like three things I really love about this. So first off you get to play, so you get your main character and you know, sometimes you get tired of playing that main character or, or doing that role and you want to do something else, but it's hard. You know, you can't just step out of, out of your character um, and plus, you know, sometimes you want to like do something else personality wise. So let's say you're playing the doctor because doctor's a very important character or an engineer, very important character. But it doesn't make sense to send your main doctor down on the planet all the time or your main engineer. You know, usually it, it's in like the assistant down or something because in Star, Starfleet, they're all capable. Everybody's capable. But this way you get a chance to play a different way so let's say you're playing you know you're playing the captain and you're always making captainy decisions and they're going to go do an away mission and you're like you know what i'm going to play the security officer this time because i really want to get in the mix i want to i like i you know if a fight breaks out i want to be right in the middle of that you know toughing it out not you know like a captain normally wouldn't really unless you're kirk get you know dive right into the mix but if you're playing the you know the main security guy you have to that's your job so then you get to do that so you get to do the, you get to play someone else for a little bit, right? If they die, it doesn't in the big scheme of things doesn't really matter. You've got a whole ship full of people like you. So it's not the worst thing in the world. I mean, you know, I mean if you're a good role player, you'd be like, "Oh man, it sucks." But, you know, in 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 all reality, that it's fine, you know, it'll work out. So you don't have to worry about losing your main character. Um, plus you, you get to do something different. And if you're successful, you bring that guy back up to the ship. And they level up, they kind of level up, and you could play them again, or it gives the game master the ability to, to, to introduce this character, and they'll have the personality that you gave them, not the personality that your, your game master gives them, because the game master is only one person. They can only come up with so many people, and you know you help flesh out all the other people on the ship, and it gives them different personalities that your game master might not have. So, for example, our game master most of the time was John. And John does a great job, but, you know, 
it, after a while, you know, all the characters kind of start to blend together a little bit, or you've seen yes, this before. They do. Right. Well, of course, of course. I mean, but he's only yeah. human. I mean, he can only think of so many things. But now, if I play like the security officer and I give him this weird quirk or something that John would have never have done or thought right. of, yep. he now has that to play with later on. Yeah. Exactly. And the mechanics of the game let you bring your personality, your character's personality mechanically into the game. So if you have a bond with another uh, character, that could affect the way that you interact with each other. If you're trying to, if you don't like each other and you're trying to work on some task where you have to work together, you're going to be at a disadvantage mechanically. Um, right. And so if you introduce more of those NPCs into the game, you can introduce that whole personality mechanic. And so if that, if that character dies, that could seriously affect your, your character mechanically in further adventures. Um, you know, they could be, depressed about that or they could feel guilty about that because they were the one that led the mission that caused it and that guilt right. not only is cool role-playing fodder but it's mechanical fodder too in the game hmm. right, right so what, what's the deal with red shirts <laughs> what's the deal with red shirts in what way i don't know man there's a whole discussion going on i didn't know if anything in the new game was uh had some mechanics with red shirts but i mean um there's, there's, uh, just people are just saying like, the... no, nothing that, nothing that pops into my head right okay. away. All right, people no. are just probably just doing some red shirt lore. People yeah, no, it's, it's, it's just the red shirt. Yeah. You know, the whole okay. red right. shirt meme as it is. Yeah. Okay, because uh, people are like they say that they have great hazard pay and um, great life insurance package. <laughs> hey, look, I like, I like the meme. Scotty, Scotty was a red shirt. Scotty wore a red shirt the right. entire original series. Right. He's That's the most we... badass red shirt ever. I know. Right. Yep. Exactly. The, the uh, Dos Ake most uh, it was the Dos Ake's guy, the you know, most uh, something man in the world. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, was a, he was a red shirt on one right. of the episodes. Bye, was he? So. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. The you know, I played him was on Star Trek. I met James Doohan at a convention one year, and oh, he wow. was just a he was a really cool dude. Like he was really personable and super super nice. Um, just I mean, just like very I don't know. He's just super super nice. I really liked him. As a, when he died, I was like, "Oh man, I really felt bad." Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, it's such an iconic, it's such an iconic show, such an iconic, you know, intellectual property. The storytelling is incredible. So, you know, making a game out of it is is a no brainer. It, it oh yeah, it sounds like that uh, you could have an entire uh, organization called like RAA, Red Shirts Anonymous, or RSA. Oh God. <laughs> I will say, hey, so John Scalzi wrote a book called Red Shirts, and it was about the secondary. It was it was a really good book. So huh. if you if you've never read any John Scalzi stuff, his Red Shirts book was really awesome. What does he? What else does he write? He wrote, uh, I think, Old Man's War, which was really really good hmm. as well. Um, I'm trying to think of what other stuff. He's written a bunch of things. Like he got a contract with Tor to do like 10 books. He like got a 10 book deal with, with tour for like, I think it was like a million dollars over 10 years or something. Good. I, it was crazy. It was, it was really cool, but red shirts was a good book. Hmm. Yeah. So there's also a die mechanic, Sean, that that's interesting. The, the, <laughs> the 2d 20 red shirt what? survivors report. No members okay. <laughs> <laughs> support group. There's no members in it though. I'm sorry. Right. Go ahead. <laughs> no, but, but like I mean, the, the I would 2d 20 make a campaign of just all red shirt characters who, you know, sure. Just, you could turn it into like a paranoia game almost. Yeah. You know? Oh yeah. Totally. Right. Totally. Just see how long you can survive. Right. It's like, it's like you could have like a, it's like a meat grinder. Like I'm going to make up five red shirts and when one yep. dies, I'll just play them in this order. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. So, so the die mechanic of the game is it's, it's a 2d 20 system that Modiphius uses for a few different games, but each game they'll alter it a bit to fit the, that specific genre. So the 2D20 system is every task you try to do, unless it's a task you can do without even trying, um, has a difficulty. Usually the difficulty is going to be like one or two. So you roll 2D20 and you try to get beneath the score that you're shooting for. The, sco that, the score that you're shooting for is a, a combination of your attribute plus the discipline that, that fits it. So your attribute, say, is going to be fitness and security if you're in a fight. So if your uh, fitness is 10 and your security is 3, that's a 13. So you're always trying to roll under 13 with those 2d20s. And if you get enough to meet or uh, exceed the difficulty, you've succeeded. Now, there are different ways that you can add 
dice to that pool. You could end up rolling 5d20 um, if you have a certain connection to a person that you're working with on this task. You, you know, there's di many different ways to, to do that. Um, then the DM has something called threat, which is kind of like their mechanical currency to make the, the game more difficult. And they can spend that threat to make your life harder. And then you can get uh, different momentum or different ways that you can then spend back to offset threat. And so there's a whole kind of currency of, of narrative play within the mechanics itself. That's cool. That is really cool. I, and I'm really looking forward to playing this. I mean, we, we've been talking about it. And I haven't, you know, the, the Game Master's like, you know, he... he He'll do this stuff where he'll announce that he's gonna we're gonna be changing systems in like six months, and then we start thinking about like oh what am I gonna play what am I gonna play, and I'm I, you know we're gonna be he's gonna set it in the Star Trek Online timeline mm -hmm. so it's after all the series that we've all seen right and it's it it'll it, I've never played Star Trek Online but it's in that timeline so there's there's certain things that have happened in the way everything is and apparently we're going to be going out into actual unknown space at that point so it'll be we're going to be starting our mission at the edge of known space at the end of after every series and going out and doing whatever and uh, I keep thinking like like god what do I want to play I mean, it's like all these there's all these like crazy stuff that you could do like I was like what if I played a, a a Vulcan that uh that didn't do the the what is it the the path of Colinar is it the the logic right. path because they don't all have to do that I mean I could play a Vulcan that grew up in human like yep. with humans and I'm just like you know because I I would have a very hard time just me because I my style of play I'd have a very hard time playing a character that had his emotions totally in check it's just are you not an my instigator. Game. I am. You, oh, yeah. The, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right on, brother. <laughs> yeah. So, so that would be difficult for me. But I also thought about, I'm thinking, I'm really leaning towards playing a trill. Mm -hmm. You know, like, like, like Dax was on the, on the yeah, show, yeah. on Deep yeah. Space Nine. So I thought about playing that. And I was like, what if I played like, a, like the doctor that was a trill? And, you know, because you have to, and you also have to be kind of good at combat. Everybody does. You're playing a role playing game and you suck at combat. You're going to be doing a lot of sitting around. Because yeah. it's just the way. It's just the way role playing games are, and I was like, "But what if I like knew a lot about anatomy, and you know, like, like was into martial arts and and tai chi and stuff like that? And maybe that was my thing. I don't know. But thinking about a lot of things, I was like, "Oh, I could play an engineer and yeah, whatever." But it's like, there's a lot of things you can do in Star Trek, and I'm just like, "What am I gonna do?" And it's like I'm like paralyzed with all the things that you can do. <laughs> yep. You know, yeah, I mean, it's such a rich environment that. Just the fact that you have all these ideas shows you know, how ripe it is for, for play. You know, hey, Mike, you know what Steve did? Steve what? played, so the last time we played Star Trek, and it wasn't the lug system, it was the one, frig, it was the one after that, I can't remember what, oh, shit, I can't remember which one it was. But um, he played a, oh, no, I know, we played it with, um, ooh, it was the one with DC, oh, anyway. So he played a, uh, a, a human that had been raised in Ferengi space. So he had been, he had been, um, like, oh. uh, I don't know, they, they found him and rescued him, and he was basically raised as a Ferengi, but he was a human. So he was playing with, like, the laws of acquisition and stuff. That was a really interesting character. Steve, He's Steve in the really chat room now. He's thinking that you should play a Trill uh, fighter pilot. Oh, Steve, well, okay. A Trill yeah. fighter pilot. A fighter pilot? Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. Wait a minute. Do Star, does Star Trek have fighter pilots? Do they, of course do they have they fighters? Do. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's not it's not something that you saw a lot in the in the series, but they certainly do. And there's in the rules, there's all sorts of uh, ships and ways to use them and how to uh, how to have battles. Okay, all right, that's cool. That's a thought because yeah. then you if you're if you were brought onto a big ship, you would obviously be part. You'd probably be the pilot, right? I mean, they would probably bring you in as because it's we're going to be on a big ship. Is yep. is the idea? And and a shout out to Steve, man. He put the brain together used them. The brain used pilots. Okay, so uh, yeah, start this. Steve, oh my God, Steve put together this thing. It was called Star Trek Late Night. We we did a <laughs> a Star <laughs> Trek campaign campaign. Oh God. And we weren't Starfleet at all. We weren't part of any Ooh. military. We were actually in a penal colony. We all started out in a penal colony. We had to write yeah. these histories, how we got into the penal colony. And then we escaped the penal colony, and we were flying around the fringes and doing crazy stuff. And 
it, it was a lot of fun. It was, and, and I got to hand it to Steve, man. He put together a fantastic campaign. That was crazy. But yeah, that and was that was yeah. neat. And he, but you know what he did? He crossed all the streams. So we put in. We mm. had the Star Trek. It, it, the Star Trek universe, they found a wormhole into the, I mean, Star Wars, the Star Wars universe, they found a wormhole, and they had brought the Death you Star. You went to the Star War? No, no, no. The Star War came to Star Trek. Oh. There was a wormhole that the Death Star came through, and a, and a bunch of the, oh, it was crazy. It was nuts. We were mixing up everything. I can't remember all the stuff that all was All you there, had to do was throw a firecracker down the vent hole. It was fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, right? <laughs> But those but it, are the best. Cool. Those are the best games and campaigns. The ones that are just mixing and mashing all sorts uh -huh. of things, totally out of control. Yep. When I was a kid, I ran a D and D top secret. If you remember the top oh, secret nice. game, yeah, yeah, I, a, a mashup of those two, where the adventure, uh, the peop, the the agents uh, from Top Secret went back in time into the D and D world and were fighting dragons and running them through the old modules. You know, all the like, village of Hamlet and all those things. But they were they were the secret agents. It was it was amazing. That's cool. It was ridiculous, That's but it was amazing. That's cool. So, so the new Star Trek game, I'm very excited about that. The, I like the mechanics already. I like all the, the the stuff that they've come up with, and I'm very excited about it. But we do we do one thing. We do have a living campaign for it. If okay. you go to modifius.com slash Star Trek, um, you can download a bunch of free adventures. Um, oh. So lots of nice. stuff to play there and it's a it's its own story there's a there's an original series storyline and then there's a next generation uh, deep space nine storyline and you can just there's probably six or seven of each up there now that you can just grab and play if you like the first one you can run a whole campaign with them so all right i'm just com forward slash what star trek Oh, okay. Okay. Yep. I, I I'd be willing to bet we're going to be playing in those because, uh, or at least a version of them because, you know, John is is good about finding all that those resources and stuff. So, I'm not going to download them because I don't want to know what happens. There you go. I'd rather I'd rather be surprised. Yep. So you um, you also worked on another product. Now I I was uh, for Aethercon. I think it was last year. I was interviewing Kat Tobin and she was talking about this and it sounded interesting. Um. A, Dracula dossier. So, so tell me about this. It, it sounded really cool. Yeah, the Dracula dossier uh, is a campaign for the Knights Black Agent game, which works on the gumshoe system from Pelgrane Press. And so how I got involved was Ken Height, who created uh, the Dracula dossier and worked on Knights Black Agents, was at a convention. And I was also a guest there. So we ended up going out to dinner together. And then play, he ran a game of it. And this was before the book came out. And... Uh, I loved it. It was so much fun. It was a great system. And so we, we started talking, and then he asked if I would write up you know, a little bit on the Dracula dossier. So I wrote one of the little adventures that, that you can play as part of it. Um, but what the gumshoe system does better than a lot of other systems is it handles investigation so well. Yeah. Because normally, you know, you come up to something, you need a clue. Oh, I rolled a one on the die. I can't get that clue. Um, so where do we go? And this just right. lets you spend resources to automatically get the clue. And then you can spend more to get more clues. Hmm. So it's a great way to run an investigative kind of spy campaign, which is exactly what uh, Knights Black Agents is. It's, it's Jason Bourne meets Dracula. That, wow. that is really cool. When I was talking to her about that, about the, the gumshoe <laughs> system, I was like, man, that is badass. Yep. Yep. Sounds a little like Bureau 13. Remember that old ditty? Yeah, 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 but 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 the 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 gumshoe system is just that is really cool. Um, you know, I I, I talked to I interviewed um, oh, shit, I can't think of his name now. But uh, he has a Sherlock in the Baker Street. Um, mm -hmm. Damn it, I, I, mm, yeah, I should know too, and I don't. Right, right, right. I I know his name. It's just not it's not doing the tongue thing, like the brain yeah. to tongue thing. But, but, but on the back burner, keep going. I will. I'll do that. But anyway, so that had a really cool that had a super cool investigation uh, mechanic, but. But he told me, he's like, he's like, yeah, it was really great, except it takes you hours and hours to put an adventure together. Like, it's really cool as it unravels, but you have to, like, really build that. And he's like, that was the one downside that he had to the game. Like, it, it was super, super cool, but it was like, oh, it was a lot of prep. Hmm. Yeah, and this, takes, this does take a little prep because you have to put together the clues. But right. it's not so hard that you can't kind of do it on the fly. Because the one clue, if you find the first clue, you're going to the next location. But the other clues that you can find will just give you some little extra information that makes 
what you're going to a little easier because you know, oh my, if there's going to be a vampire there, then we need these resources when we go in. <laughs> right, so, that you know, helps. Just, yep, yep. So you're spending a little up front to save a little pain on the back end. And then yeah. again, you're managing resources um, as you spend these points to gain these clues. And you know what? That, that is really rewarding because I, I, like at conventions, when I run adventures at conventions, one of the things I always try and strive to do is when the when the your heroes arrive to an area and they have a chance to like buy equipment, talk to people in the bar, whatever, do the research, you know, the whole thing right before you go on the adventure. I try to put in like if they do an investigation or they ask around or do a – depending on what the game is and what the skill check would be um, – they can find out these clues, and if they roll high enough, the like the better the clues get. You know, mm -hmm. if they roll really bad, they get they get actually get bad clues. You know, if they right. if they like fumble or whatever. But I try to put that in, so you know, so I can encourage them to try and like you know uh, help them on the adventure. And if they don't do that stuff, it makes the adventure much harder for them. But if they do, it can make the adventure very easy on them, and they get a sense of satisfaction out of it because, like. When the adventure is easy, they don't feel like, oh, it wasn't challenging. They actually feel like, wow, I'm so glad that I prepared and made the – they see that. They actually feel – it's like like I did good. I didn't have to fight so hard because I did all my work prepping. Right. You know, they don't feel like they, they nerfed it. Hey, yeah. Sean, are you, are you familiar with the new top secret at all? I am not, and I really wish I were. Uh, I know – who was working on it and i i was trying to get a game of it at gen con like two years ago uh and i uh yeah i was busy too i was running games for 20 hours and then having meetings so i didn't get over there but i would love to try it yeah i might know some people yeah. who know some people <laughs> but so, uh, yeah. shameless plug anyone else is interested uh we're gonna have uh in a later this season we'll have uh the the makers um of the new top secret on the game school podcast as well. Sweet. Yeah, is it it's coming. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll have we'll probably have Merle. We might have Merle and Alan. It's hard to say. It's hard to say. I'll tell you why. Because <laughs> I I love I love Merle, but you know he's getting up in age and doing yeah. like like this kind of thing. This 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 interactive mm -hmm. online thing is not exactly quite his thing. Gotcha. Um, but we might have Alan. Alan's a little more more up to date on um, on, on the the speed of tech. Uh, yep. But we might have we might have Merle. I don't know. We haven't figured it out yet. Um, if if we do, it'll probably be like Merle and Jason Elliott. And mm -hmm. Jason will probably run the game, and Merle will be like the, the he will do the talking and such. And then Jason will handle all the like tech and and sure. you know mechanics and stuff. Um, but yeah, so, so I mean for any. For anyone living under a rock, uh, I work for TSR, so I'm 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 part of that crew. I didn't work on Top Secret. Um, I did the the video for the Kickstarter, so cool. uh, so so I'm I'm and I've run it multiple times at conventions mm -hmm. and stuff. Uh, but it, yeah, it is it is cool. It's a lot of fun. It's neat. Yeah, I played it too. I like it. Yeah, that's on my list. Yeah. I'll tell you what if. The hacking rules I really love. They're simple. They're super simple, and they make sense. You you literally you roll against each other. So whatever the defense is versus the the attacker. Um, so, I, so I'm trying to hack in the system, and and it, it roll it has a stepping dice system. So let's say I'm rolling a d8 for my hacking. It would probably be higher, and it's multiple dice. So I'd like a d8 for my skill, and then one for my stat, and then one for like a situational. Um, but for my skill, let's say it's a D8. If I make the roll, I, there's so many successes you have to get through the system. If I make the roll, I get another step. If I fail the roll, I step that die down to a D6. Okay. Right? So then if right. I make that roll, I get another step. But if I miss it, then I step it down to a okay. D4. And I really, really like that because it's, it's, it's like super intuitive and super like just really easy it's basically you just roll a couple times and then if you get the system you get through it or if you don't you don't right. and it really gives you that feel of trying to hack through it right and there's that tension as the dice get lower yes. and lower it gets harder yes. and harder yeah and that's you know that that's a if you have a system that can do that if you can find the mechanics that can make the narrative feel that way then you've done a great job yeah right. yeah so uh i'm i'm monitoring the chat and uh, I don't know. Do we do our due diligence, Pete, about sort of introducing or kind of giving more of um, Sean's background? Because people are trying to find and want Sean to be on Game School, 
but I don't know if like, uh, for instance, I know you freelance, Sean, right? Yeah. Yep. So are you, are you in heavily involved in any one um, game right now that you would qualify to be a <laughs> representative of, or, uh, but my background is I do freelance work for Wizards of the Coast. I'm not a full-time employee. Um, I, the, the company that I work for directly is called Encoded Designs, and we make a bunch of different games. And we have a Kickstarter going on right now for a game uh, called Iron Edit Accelerated, which uses the Fate Accelerated rules to play a Norse, uh, epic Norse game at the beginning of Ragnarok. No. Uh, but I, I dabble in many different directions, so I don't. I really don't represent any one company. Right. Uh, I you represent don't have that, all that stupid responsibility. I get right. it. Right. I get you it. know what? You know what though? So so uh, let's let's do that. Let's talk about the fate accelerated. So okay. so your Kickstarter's. It, it's not your Kickstarter, but it's a Kickstarter you're involved with. Um, how long is that going? That that's going for It's going for another 48 hours basically. Oh god, okay. So right. If if you go uh to Kickstarter right now and look at Iron Edda Accelerated, uh you will see what it's all about. Uh Iron Edda was a game that came out a few years ago uh that used the Fate system, but the developer uh named Tracy Barnett decided that Fate Accelerated might be a better way to do things. Okay. Uh, and Evil Hat, which does Fate and Fate Accelerated, used Fate Accelerated for their Dresden Files game. Hmm. And so, you know, piggybacking on the, that technology, um, we decided to take Tracy's game and see if we could make a version of it that's a little smoother than, than just the Fate version. And mm -hmm. so that's what we're doing. If you have, um, have, are you familiar with Fate at all? You know, I have never played it, and uh, but I am a little familiar with it. I know it's 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 very heavy on the storytelling element of, of the game. Of you know, it's less it's less worried about stats and skills, and more about like how you use them and, and how you describe things, right? Yep, it's the mechanics are very narrative based. So your your character will have attributes. They're called aspects, and if you are able to do something that uses one of those aspects, you you can. Hmm. Then use a fate point, which is, again, the currency uh, of the narrative. Use a fate point to get a bonus. And so it's basically that. If, if the story that you're telling matches the, what's on your character sheet, you're going to get a bonus. Um, you, you roll fate dice, which have a plus, a minus, or a zero on them. Hmm. So you're rolling four of those. So you're never going to get a number more than plus four or less than minus four. And that then gets put onto your attributes. So if you have a, a three in something and you roll a plus two, then you're at five and everything is measured even then in narrative terms because a zero is mediocre, a one is good, a two, it, it goes up to plus eight from there where eight is like the highest you can get is outstanding. Um, so it's a very narrative-based game. And what Fate Accelerated does is even narrow that down even more and make it even more narrative-based. So uh, that's why we thought, Fate Accelerated might be a good fit for this game where you play, like I said, you play, uh, it's a Norse game where you play a character at the beginning of Ragnarok, but you have all these powers that are given to you by the gods. So you could play a character that bonds yourself to the ske skeleton of a giant to fight these dwarven machines that are also huge. Um, so it's almost like a kaiju kind of oh, game sweet. but that in God that in it. that sounds cool you know, with a Norse background. So so you know what we should do? We should have you on game school to to, to run that, but the we have there's one of the rules that we have so we have we have a couple rules for game school. For one, it has to be a tabletop RPG. Mm -hmm. Two, it has to be something you can buy in you can buy as soon as the show's over. So if you listen to it you're like, oh I love it, you can go buy it. So when would this be available to buy? Um uh, it should be probably by the beginning of next year. Uh, okay. Because we've got the we've got the rules pretty much done. Um, when the Kickstarter's done, that will give us the money for the art, which is really the only reason we're doing it. Right, right. Um, right. And then so we'll put the art in, we'll lay it out, uh, and probably by the end of this year, beginning of next year, it should be set for sale. Okay. So you know what? When it is set for sale, when it is, because that's one of our rules, is one of our sure. one stipulations we have to have. 
once people can buy it, we'll have you on. you got to run this. This sounds like a really cool game. And that's when we can cover Fate Accelerated. So we'll cover Fate Accelerated uh, as a system, but we can do it with that with, with that book because we do that from time to time where we, we just pick a setting, like somebody's done a setting book. And it's usually when the setting book is really, like, you know, intense. Like it has a lot of mechanics and changes and it has its own flavor to it. Um, yeah. So that would be fantastic. We should do that. Totally. Yep, this that. definitely this definitely fits that rule of and, lots of flavor. And cool. Sean, I mean, maybe uh, after we're we're off air, you can give us some information or put us in touch with uh, the Star Trek folks. Um, you know, I think that there seems to be a lot of uh, desire in the chat room. People would love to see that um, that demonstration on that system. So that oh yeah, oh, we'll definitely put you in charge. Uh, put you in touch with people. I'll who put me in charge. Yeah, I'll yeah, put yeah, you in yeah. charge of that. Yeah, right. Okay. Ahead. Fantastic. I love it. I love it. Okay. All right. So, all right, all right Real quick, let's do just – yeah, let's do the um, – what was the, the Kickstarter again? How do you get there? Um, it is Iron Edda, E-D-D-A, Accelerated. Or if you also look for encoded designs, you will be able to find that uh, Kickstarter as well. All right, cool. That sounds like a really cool Kickstarter. All right, I got I'll one try. last thing. One last thing before we go to the game. Um, so I'm <laughs> starting another podcast. Uh, but, but I'll tell you – look, look. Look, I know I got I do a lot of stuff and I got a lot of stuff on my but this one is dear to my heart. So what you have just seen, what we have just done on this this episode is pretty much that Kickstarter or Kickstarter listen to me, is that podcast. It's just talking to game designers about game design. But it'll probably it wouldn't be like all of these. It would be like one. Like I would I would talk to Sean about D and D fifth edition. I would and I would most of the time I'm gonna pick one like one real thing that I want to talk about. So Here's why it's not crazy, Mike, to do another one. First sure. off, first off, I'm going to mostly do it through an app called Anchor. And oh, Anchor, okay. Anchor's just it I call you on the phone and we talk. We just talk. There's no uh, there's going to be no promotion. There's going to be no editing, zero editing. What we record is what goes. There's going to be zero like um, like if I do an intro, it'll be super simple. It'll be like, dun, 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 gearhead gamers. And that's it. That, that's it. Um, there's not going to be any, um, I'm not going to do blog posts. I'm not going to, I'm not even, I'm barely going to talk about it. And it's going to be on the, the, the TSR podcast network. So when people run into it, it'll be probably because like I mentioned it on my Facebook page or because they saw it in the lineup of podcasts on the TSR podcast network. And it's just it, it the whole concept of the show is hey two game designers are talking in a bar and you're sitting at the table with them mm. that's it it's it's going to be super simple boom in and out there's no standard length for a show there's no um there's no requirement i mean there's almost zero requirements whatsoever i'm Just literally going to instagram the bitch you're not even going to have a twitter account right, for right. It, are you there's going to be no twitter no web page <laughs> no Fucking nothing. It is guerrilla podcasting. Why don't you if, just go to a bar and talk to a game designer? Huh? That's essentially what I'm doing, but recording it. And it's it's my excuse to talk to game designers about game design. It's my pet love project. It's just for me to talk to other game designers about game design. All so, right. Well, we look forward to that. Tick, tick. All right. It'll be called Gearhead Gamers, everybody. <clears throat> all right. So, Sean, is, give me some links. Where, where, where can we find your stuff? Uh, the best place to find me is on Twitter at Sean Merwin. Um, if you go onto the DMs Guild, which is a place that Wizards allows people to sell their own D and D products, you can just search there for Sean S H A W N Merwin M E R W I N. I have my own podcast uh, on the Misdirected Mark Network called Down with D and D. Uh, we're a weekly show talking for an hour about D and D. Nice, and awesome. You can go to the Encoded Designs dot com website and see some of the other stuff that uh me and the guys have been working on all right cool awesome 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 well sean thanks for coming on but we're gonna play a game don't go anywhere all right every bad day it's game time with the Mythwits. i'm your host peter bryant and on this episode we're gonna be playing bet the geek so sean you are a D D. Uh, file. You've done a lot of D&D &D stuff. So this is going to be Bet the Geek and they're all going to be D&D &D questions. Oh boy. So this I am is how, old. This is how it works. There's some old ones and there's some new ones. Um, this is how it works. <clears throat> I'm going to ask you a question. Then Mike and I are going to bet on whether you know the answer or not. 
Okay. And Mike and I can bet one to three points. So when I ask you a question, don't answer it. Just be like, mm-hmm, yeah, okay, good question. And then, <laughs> and then Mike and I have to figure out whether we think you'll know the answer. And we're going to bet, you know, yes or no uh, for a certain number of points. And, um, you know, the person with the highest points wins between me and Mike. Uh, now, I'm going to give – what I'm going to do, I'm going to start it out with three questions. And these are just test questions to see where your knowledge lies. Now, I already have a good sense of it from our discussion. Uh, so you know you know quite a bit. But I could trip you up with some of these. Now, all these questions come from my game, Cube of Death, which is going to be coming out before too long. Uh, so, so here we go. So, Sean, I'm going to ask you first question. And you can go ahead and just answer this one and, until we I get to the, the actual question. I got the up too, by the way. All right, all good, good, good. All right, fantastic. So, Sean, your first question, and again, you can answer this one right away. According to Q1, Queen of the Demon Web Pits, what plane does Loth reside in? This is going way back. Yeah. Uh, well, the Abyss. That's correct. Okay, Correct. I didn't know if you wanted to know the number. That was where I was no. going. No, 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 just the abyss. And that would be a... Uh, okay, question number two. What breath weapon does a white dragon have? Cold. That's right. Cone of cold. And the last test question, according to the 5E SRD, how many rounds does a dancing weapon attack... Oh, how many rounds does a dancing weapon attack once activated? That's a tough one. I'm going to say yes. 10. That is four. But very good. No, no, we're getting, we're getting an idea. We're getting an idea. That was a tough one. That really it's a little bit of an obscure, obscure weapon. Not a lot of people hand those out. I, I don't think – I think I have encountered it once in my entire role-playing career that someone had a dancing weapon. So, Mike, are you ready? Are you feeling good about this one? Uh, yes. All right. So let me do, uh, let me turn the scores on. And did that work? Yes. Okay. Scores are up. All right. So here we go. Here we go. So Sean, don't answer these one. Don't answer these questions until Mike and I have bet. The first question is, why were the original D&D module maps printed in a particular shade of blue? Hey, no one wants to see your face. Put his face up. I'll put his face up when he's answering. When I'm when I'm reading the question. Oh, no, anyway. I need to see his face. Okay. Well, you you can control your own screen, yo. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, how about that? So. Oh yeah. <laughs> so it's I'll late. read it again. <laughs> I'll read it again, Sean. Uh, why were the original D and G module maps printed in a particular shade of blue? Mike, what do you think? You think uh, you think Sean's gonna know this one? Hmm, God. I uh, certainly wouldn't go with whether I know it or not that right, uh, he yeah. would know it. So, yes. uh, oh, what the hell? I'm going to say uh, two that he knows it. Okay, okay. So that's a bet, yes. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, why is that not working? Bet, why? Why nothing's nothing is keyboarding. What's <laughs> with your keyboard, dude? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Okay. All right. You know what, Mike? I'm gonna say I'm 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 gonna say yes. I think he knows this one too. But I'm gonna I'm gonna go all and I'm gonna go three. Yeah. Sure you are. Don't put it on yours, yo. You gotta put it on mine. Oh shit. Yeah. About that. <laughs> all right. So, Sean, Sean, why why were these maps painted in that shade of blue? All right. I don't know if this is the correct answer. But I think with the printing technology of the day, the the only cost-effective way that they could do it was that monochrome blue uh, map. Is that your final answer? That is. Ah, oh, man, and I got this right from Tim Cask himself. The mm -hmm. reason why they painted them blue or, or printed them in that blue was so that people couldn't photocopy the maps because ah, Xerox wouldn't ah. photocopy that color of blue. It's actually called photocopy or non, non photocopy blue. I think is the actual yep. name. Yeah. And now so that you that, say that, I do remember hearing that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. Very yeah, good. Good. Right. Good start. Good start. Okay. 
Question two. According to the SRD, oh crap, I don't know which SRD this is. I think this might be 3.5. Shit, I hope I don't get this wrong. Okay, the Holy Avenger, I hope this is straight across all the boards. The Holy Avenger gives what bonus to attack in the hands of a non-paladin? And Mike, I'm going to go first. This one's a bit tricky, I think. I think I'm going to say no for two. All right. No for two. And I am uh, shit. I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to say I'm going to say no for one. Okay. All right. I want to be less wrong than you. <laughs> All right, Sean. What does the the Holy Avenger do in the hands of a non-paladin? I what think bonus? this is going to be different across editions, but I'm going to go with plus one. All right. Well, we'd have to look this up, but I'm going to say from my from from whatever one I found, it was plus two. Two. Yep. Plus two. Mm -hmm. All right. So, Mike, we both. We both failed on that one. Yeah, oh, I, mean, no. I failed. I failed less than you. you no, 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 no. Wait a minute. That's a yes because he. he you got to put that in. We got that right because we said we, he wouldn't know you, it. Yeah, you said no. You're finally realizing oh. how. how yes. I there, there we go. All right. Cool. Cool. All oh, right. So just put a Y in that box. In this one. Yes. There you go. Okay. And then in that one. Yes. But that doesn't yes, make there you sense. Go. It does make sense because we said that he wouldn't know it and he didn't. See? Right, but I was still less wrong than you. <laughs> Why do I have... No, I no, have... you were less right than me because we vet, bet that he wouldn't know it and he didn't oh. know it. See how that works? No, I don't know. Okay. It. You've only done this like five or six hundred times. <laughs> all right, so anyway. <clears throat> so, uh, <laughs> all right. So, Sean, question number three. I'm going to put it right on you so people can see your face when I read this. Name the queen of the chromatic dragons. Mike, what do you think? Uh, Queen of the chromatic oh, dragon. Shut up. Yeah, I know that. I know what you're insinuating. Uh, I am going to say it's a funny story. I'm going to allow Pete to tell this there's one. A, near there's the a whole back. No, I'm not going to tell it. There's a whole backstory. Oh. We've okay. told it on the show a hundred times. Um, I'm going to say yes for uh, three. Hmm. See, now I would gain three, but you know what? I think he's going to know it, too. And I really think he's going to know it. So I'm going to say yes for three as well. Sean. <laughs> no pressure, buddy. No pressure. We both think you're going to know this. Yep. Uh, it's Tiamat. That is absolutely correct. All right. Fantastic. All right. So uh, only two more. Only two more to subject you to. All right. So according to the 5E SRD, at what rate does a ring of regeneration heal your character? And I'll go first. Now, this is a very common magic item, and everyone should know this, but it can also be tricky because you've got all these different additions. To know that right off the top of your head, because there's a thousand magic items. I'm going to say yes for one. Because uh, I think he's going to know it, but I'm not like a hundred percent sure. All right. Um, I, 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 jeez. Um, I'm going to say, you said yes for one. I'm going to have to go yes for two. Yes for two. Okay. All right, Sean, at what rate does the uh, Ring of Regeneration heal your character? I'm going to go with 1d6. Every... Oh. Because there's a rate? There's a rate? Um, every round. How long's a round? A round is six seconds. Okay. Oh man, damn it! Yeah. It's, but you were close. One d six every ten minutes. Every ten minutes. Okay. Which is that the fastest a ring of regeneration has healed in, in D and D? I yeah. It used to just be a straight rate, but 
it's it's changed over the additions. Like I think it used to be like one point every ten minutes or something, didn't it? Like yeah. forever. But it's like I saw that and I was like one d six every ten minutes. Holy shit, man! You're like Wolverine, you know? <laughs> like that's that's some fast healing, especially at low levels. Yeah. All right. Last question. All right. Last question. According to and again the SRD, and I'm sorry, there's all these additions and stuff. Uh, <laughs> If an eleventh level wizard casts magic missile, how many will he fire? He or she? How many will they fire? And Mike, you have to go first this time. What do you think? Eleventh level the- wizard. Yes, according to the SOD, an eleventh level wizard casts magic missile. How many will they fire? Uh, I'm gonna say that he doesn't know it. Uh, for two. Doesn't know it for two. Wow, we are so close right now, dude. Um, anything I do could make or break. Doesn't know it for two. You know what? I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go crazy. I'm gonna say, what is with your keyboard, man? What's going on? I don't with know, your man. I'm, I'm hitting buttons and nothing's happening. All right, here. Look, I got it. I got it. No for two, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, I got it. All right, so Sean, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna go all in. I, I'm gonna I'm going to bet that you that you know this. I, I'm gonna you're gonna figure it out. You're gonna do the math, and you're gonna know this. Hey hey so hey hey! Gonna, don't what? don't know these cryptic little things about maths. That's a <laughs> hint. Hey, no, hey shut your mouth. Shut your no, mouth. No, it's it's not a hint. All that shit's based on math because you have to like do levels and whatever. I'm gonna say you know it for three. So I'm going all in, Sean. 11th level okay. wizard, how many magic missiles? So this is definitely not 5th edition, because in 5th edition, you can actually change the level of the spell to get more. And it has right. nothing to do with the level you're at. But So then it's the SRD 3.5. <laughs> okay. I'm going to go with 2, 3, 4, 6. 6. Mm-hmm. Ah, it's 5. 5. 5, so close. And I, yeah, because I think it's first level. Was it first and then third and then fifth? That's a first, third, fifth, seventh, ninth. 9 11 would be six. That's what six, I said. Yeah. It should be. Should I look this up real quick, Mike, or should I just go with the answer I have written in my thing? I, I, I trust you you to to have it correct. I think I, I, I probably looked. I know I probably looked up at one time. It, oh, dude, we tied. How do we tie? Uh, well, I don't understand. So let me say, in this column that says correct, <laughs> I'm supposed to put down, so I said no for two. Am I supposed to say I was right or I was wrong? It's not about you. It's about him being right. Was he correct right, so, or was he not correct? Right. He was not correct. So you put an okay. N. That's no. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, how did we tie? Because I had, I went two. It, we, we, uh... Am I missing something? Yes, you are. Really, you yes, learned a valuable are. lesson that you should always bet against me. <laughs> it's really what you've learned. No, this game is this game is deceptively hard. It really is. All right, so hold on. Uh, let me look at For every two caster level, every two caster levels two. beyond first, you gain a dead additional missile. So two at third, three at fifth. Oh, I know why. It's a trick question. Four at seventh, and the maximum at five at yeah. ninth. That's correct. Okay. That's why it is. All right, so we tied. Um, shit, Mike, we tied. Um, Yay! Hey, in my you know book, what? what? In my book, that's a win. We're all. I'm gonna, you know what? I'm gonna call it, Mike. You know so little about D and D. You're the winner. I give it to Mike this week. <laughs> Good job, Mike. Plus, I get a handicap for keeping scores. Yes, you do. Well, I, mean, I am a handicap for keeping right. scores. <laughs> You were handicapped at keeping score. Yes. All right. All right, Sean. That's it. That's our show. Thanks. Uh, and, Thanks and for coming you, on. If you really wanted to know uh, any of the uh, things, Big Daddy Spencer is uh, a longtime um, addition, and he, he he's spouting off rules right and left. So I hadn't even been reading it, but, uh, wow, he is uh, – he, he is in, man. All yeah, in. He, he, he's a gear. we got to have him on. He's a there gearhead. you, you got to have him on your show. Well, no, if not unless he's a game designer. It has to be the game designer themselves. Although, I guess I could talk to anybody about game design, right? Yes. Okay, maybe I will. Hey, Daddy Spence, maybe I'll have you on. So, anyway, thanks, Sean, for joining us. Um, yes, thank you, know, you Sean. He's thank got you. a Kickstarter. 
We should go check that Kickstarter out. Yes, um, it's in the comments. Let me see if I can pin it up later. But it, it sounds really cool. That does sound really cool. Playing playing um, uh, right before Ragnarok. It sounds pretty badass. And like like crazy stuff, right? I mean, like you said, a giant skeleton and 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 yeah. dwarven machines running around and. And you could play a, a simple farmer can be just as cool as one of those uh, other players because you are dealing with not only the battles but the morale of of the people in your homestead. So you know it's a social game as well. You could play it either way. Oh, freaking, that's awesome! That is really cool. So All I right. pinned a comment about the uh, Kickstarter. So check it out, everyone. Thank you. Okay, cool, cool. Um, you know what? You know what I did, Mike. I closed my notes out. I don't know why I closed my notes out. You've just watched another episode. <laughs> I know, right? That, that's what I did. So, um, uh, well, uh, do, you, do I still need to stall? So I'm stalling. And, oh, one, look at that. Don't, no one look at the picture where the pictures go. Cause, uh, yeah, because hold on. Because it, uh, it's, a, it's a thing. <laughs> and I, it's so anyway. Many, so, so many uh, friggin' buttons. So Sean, you, you are a moderator of uh, the, um, what is that called? Of the, oh, Aether. Uh, Aether 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 okay, cool. Yep. I got, I got roped in as well. So, uh, yep. And my last interview is on Thursday of this yes. week. You know, All it's right. fun. I love doing that, but it is a relief when it's over. Just, I, it just cause it is, cause you know, it's it's like there's that stress of doing it, but it's yep, fun while it lasts. Exactly, it's great, and you're like, that was cool. And then you have to get ready for the next one, and you're yeah. like, well, boy, I've got writing to do. Right, absolutely. So, all right, and I, I have to edit all the videos. So anyway, okay, I found it, Mike. I'm all done. Okay, great. Ready? Here we go. Uh, you have just enjoyed another awesome episode of the Myth Wits. We're live on Facebook, Mondays, 9 p.m. Eastern Time. Please ask our guests questions or just banter with the other Myth Fits. We had a lively discussion going on. 178 comments at this very moment. Yeah. Um, if you don't have time for videos, make sure to subscribe via our podcast uh, using your favorite podcatcher. Do the like, follow, subscribe thing wherever it's appropriate. And make sure to share your favorite episode on social media to help spread the Mythwits love over the entire planet. You can also go into iTunes and give us a fantastic review. We would never turn that down. Mythwits is a Creative Commons product. Like and share it in all the places. Just don't edit it. Don't sell it. And don't try to kill a frost giant with it. Mythwits is part of the TSR Podcast Network. Check out TSRPN.com for more cool shows like Game School, like, ooh, like this show Gearhead Gamers I heard about that's coming. Mm. And make sure to check out our parent company, Aetherforge.com, for more cool stuff and join our mailing list. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Tell your friends to tune in. And until next week, Mike? Chromatic Dragons are uh, they're, they're, they're the, the, the metal ones, right? Yes. No, they're the color ones. The color <laughs> ones, Mike. The metal the ones. Color. Chrome. It's chrome. No. Chrome no, dragon. Color. Chromatic. Color. Color. Chromatic. Color. Color. It's color. Chrome. 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 Chrome.